Greetings, everybody, and, I, and I'd like to welcome you to the final reading of Chapter 12 of The Grand Design Exposed, which is called The Perpetrators and Evolution of the Great French Revolution. And we're going to back up one paragraph for continuity. And just uh, so we can kind of have a brief review of what uh, is going on before the escalation that leads to revolution. Take notice <clears throat> that each calculated step prepared the way for the next and the progression to attain their ultimate goal. And who was the they? Well, it was, uh, you have, for example, Roman Catholic Abbey Emmanuel Joseph Saiz, or CA. Um, you had the Freemasons. You had Duke de Aiguan, the Marquis de Condorcet, and the Vicomte de Noyle. You had all of these, um, you have the, uh, you have um, the Catholic Abbey Talleyrand Perigord, who became the Bishop of Alton in January 1789. So he had a lot of people that would constitute as the uh, um, the they that were the perpetrators. And amongst these, like I said, you got the Freemasons, you have the Illuminati, you have all of these things. But it just seems, oddly enough, that, you know, the the ones that were supposedly suppressed always seem to be sticking around, overseeing things. And, um... And that's what is really behind the they that fomented revolution. <clears throat> so take notice that each calculated step prepared the way for the next in the progression to attain their ultimate goal. And this is usually how revolutions start pay attention, which was to arouse, inflame, and energize the whole populace of France, especially the masses of commoners. For example, France's financial distress, whether real or exaggerated, compelled a need for a competent finance minister. After the services of several, one finally presents a plan that offered an honest solution. <clears throat> but from the very outset knew that his proposal would be like poking a stick in a hornet's nest. And I also want to um, bring up this notion as well. Whenever you hear the aspect of the word solution especially when it comes to economics, politics, revolutions, wars. You always have to dig a little deeper to understand the thesis and antithesis, and you have to understand the Hegelian principle. Okay? Problem, reaction, Solution. So did e <clears throat> so again, after the services of several, one finally presents a plan that offered an honest solution, but from the very outset knew that his proposal would be like poking a stick in a hornet's nest. So did everyone else. His reward was disgrace and criminal charges. In sheer desperation, the king ramrodded the tax plan through. 
and just as haughty determination, the aristocracy opposed it, demanding the broader consulting body of the estates general. This opened wide the floodgates of commoners who, as 96% of the population of France, demanded to be heard as the true voice of the nation. From the plotter's viewpoint, things now were on a roll. And here we come to the next section, which is called Rehearsing Revolution, Commoners Stage Riots. As a country facing famine and rehearsing revolution, it began early in the new year of 1789 to elect deputies from each class group for the upcoming Estates General Convocation. In all, 1,214 representatives were elected, 285 nobles, 308 clergy, and 621 for the Third Estate. From the time of the election, the mood of the nation turned ugly and intensified as the meeting of the Estates General approached. In several districts, there were repeated revolts against taxes and the cost of bread. In Lyons, the populace invaded the office of the tax collector and destroyed his registers. At Ogde, near Montpellier, the people threatened a general pillage unless the prices of commodities were reduced. They were reduced. Villages fearing a shortage of grain forcibly prevented the export of grain from their districts. At Montlery, the women, hearing that the price of bread had been raised, led a mob into the granaries and bakeries and seized all available bread and flour. Here and there, the populace took matters into its own hands. It threatened to hang at the nearest lamppost any merchant hiding grain or charging too much for it. Similar scenes were almost everywhere in France. In town after town, orders aroused and excited the people by telling them that the king had postponed all tax payments. A report ran through province in March and April that, quote, the best of kings desires tax equality, that there are to be no more bishops, nor seigneurs, nor tithes, nor dues, no more titles or distinctions. After April 1st, 1789, feudal dues were no longer paid. In Paris, the center of agitation, the excitement mounted daily as pamphlets poured from the press, and orders lifted their voices at the cafes and clubs. In these angry mobs, the Duce d'Orleans saw a possible instrument for his own greedy ambition. His awe-consuming desire to be king played wonderfully into the hands of his confessors, who encouraged, who encouraged, nurtured, and benefited from the savory idea. Being the king's cousin and the richest man in France, he himself became an instrument used by the revolution's plotters. When his role had served its purpose, even though he was Grand Master of all French masonry, it was as nothing to send him to the guillotine to have his head chopped off, just like thousands of others during the time prompted by his hidden superiors, he determined to make himself an idol of the people. He gave to the poor, recommended national, national, wow, nationalization of ecclesiastical property and threw open to the public the garden and some rooms of his palace royal in the very heart of Paris. <clears throat> Almost kind of sounds like Pope Francis now, doesn't it? He gave to the poor, recommended a national nationalization of ecclesiastical property. <clears throat> so, I mean... There is so much that happened within the French Revolution that we can use to glean from as to what is happening today. And since we are discovering who is behind and who was behind both the American and French Revolution, when you see all these things happening today, 
it is no wonder and it's really no speculation as to, as to who is behind today's events. Is it the hidden superiors? The money of the Duke became an irresistible temptation and incentive when offered in return for special favors by his secretary, Chateau de la Claw, who, acting as his agent, organized public demonstrations and revolts, and kept the soldiers in pay to refuse to act, throwing France into a virtual mob violence frenzy. It was in these gardens, cafes, gambling houses, and brothels near his palace that the pamphleteers exchanged ideas and formal plans. Here thousands of people of all classes joined in the agitation of the hour. The Palace Royale, as a name for all this complex, became the hub of the revolution. The Deuce d'Orleans, unlimited services, and all his wealth, and I mean all, was given without reservation for the promised kingship, Pot of Gold, that was dangled in front of him at the end of the rainbow. Treachery and violent death became his only reward. Riots springing up all over France became an easy enough accomplishment when it was learned you could vent your frustrations and actually get paid for it too. And being in a superior's pay gave participants the feeding or the feeling of having authorities backing that gave license and ease to perform their criminal acts, especially when there was little fear of retribution from soldiers who were also in pay to look the other way. Intermittent mob violence electrified the air. It hastened in persuading the decision to give the third states or commoners the right to elect representatives for the estates general that equaled the amount of both the nobles and clergy. <clears throat> Excuse me. That being accomplished, the next step was to get all three orders, instead of working separately, to come together and cooperate as one unified body. To accomplish this feat and other marvelous achievements for the cause, Abbey Joseph C.A rose to the occasion and did his work splendidly. Abbey Joseph C.A., leader of class struggle. <laughs> Joseph C.A., priest of Rome, wrote pamphlets that could excite the populace, but as a member of his own order of the clergy was rejected as a deputy for the estates general. This worked very well. For the commoners welcomed him with open arms as one of their own delegates who then became their leading influence in guiding them through the early stages of the estates general meetings. Was this mere coincidence? Honored with the presence of the king and queen, deputies of, of all three orders of the estates general came together on Monday, May 4, 1789, for a procession through the streets of Versailles to hear Mass of the Holy Spirit at the Church of St. Louis. Members of each order, conspicuously separated and distinguished by their dress, moved in a stately procession while the townspeople crowded the streets, the balconies, and the roofs. They applauded the commoners, the king, and the Deuce d'Orleans, and received with silence the nobles, the clergy, and the Queen. The next day, the King opened the first session of the convention with a brief address, frankly confessing the financial distress of his government, attributed to a costly but honorable war, quote unquote, which was the American Revolution. Asking for an quote unquote augmentation of taxes and deploring, quote-unquote, an exaggerated desire for innovation, Necker followed with a three-hour speech admitting a deficit of 56,150,000 livres, 
it was really 150, 150 million and asked sanctions for a 80 million liver loan. The deputies were overwhelmed by his brain taxing statistics. Most of them had expected the liberal minister to expound a program of reform. The struggle of the classes began the day after, when the nobles and the clergy went to separate halls. The third estate refused to acknowledge itself a separate chamber. It waited resolutely and urged the other estates to join in, or to... Let me repeat that. It waited resolutely and urged the other states to join it and vote man by man. The nobles replied that to merge the three classes in one and allow individual voting would be to surrender the intelligence and character of France to mere number and burgius, burgius dictation. The clerical delegates divided between conservatives and liberals, took no stand, waiting to be guided by events, and a month passed. Meanwhile, the price of bread continued to rise despite Necker's attempts to regulate it, <clears throat> and the danger of public violence increased as the flood of pamphlets continued to agitate touchy feelings. And these pamphlets... Oh, man. Again, another example we can read about this propaganda and pamphlets and pamphleteering and these types of things. Um, you can check out a book by Avril Manhattan um, entitled Vietnam, Why Did We Go? Okay? And um, you're going to see the same type of propaganda. And the thing is, is propaganda... Propaganda is a very, very great tool in the psychiatric war that the Jesuit order loves to use. Loves to use propaganda. <laughs> and we have propaganda all over the place. I mean, just look at the elections. Uh, look at the movies. I mean, look at I mean Hollywood. Look at the entertainment industry. The music industry. All of these TV channels. I mean, it's all propaganda <clears throat> to get your feelings stirred up. And if you don't realize that your mind can be persuaded by this propaganda by simply coming up with the excuse, well, I'm only listening to these things to understand it then really in a sense you're playing right into the hands of the war without ever even you knowing it and you could very well end up being one of the ones that destroys your neighbor and thinks that you are doing God a service. So propaganda is is a huge tool. Is a huge tool. I, I mean, I, I can't I can't stress that enough. I mean, it's <laughs> Anyways, back to the book. On June 10th, the deputies of the Third Estate sent a committee to the nobles and clergy again inviting them to a joint meeting and declared that if the other orders continued to meet separately, the Third Estate would proceed without them to legislate for the nation. The break in the contest came on June 14th when nine parish priests came over to the commoners. On that day, the Third Estate elected Jean Sylvain Bailey, its president, and organized itself for deliberation and legislation. Encouraged by this break in the privileged orders, ranks, 
CA now propose that, as the third estate represented 96% of the nation, they should immediately start the work the country was waiting to see performed. As a first step, the name of Estates General should be officially abandoned and the third should confer upon itself a title that implied its unique authority, which was to appropriate complete sovereignty to itself, quote-unquote, the people. CA also proposed the simple and explicit National Assembly. Bear in mind, you have to bear in mind that this CA is a very high-ranking Catholic abbey, bishop, priest, whatever you want to call him. He's very high up there in the hierarchy, so to speak. <clears throat> it was approved by 490 votes to 89. The Declaration automatically changed the absolute monarchy into a limited one, ended the special power to the upper classes, and constituted, politically, the beginning of the Revolution. <laughs> so, this Abbey CA, you know, this, this cardinal or bishop or whatever, um is on the side of the people. And so who was it that was really behind all the signings and these types of things? <clears throat> and uh, to garner a voice of the people. It was this abbey. And so this this CA was basically the one that spear tipped, did the final nail in the coffin that would launch France into revolution. And now the clergy votes to join commoners. Oh my goodness. Almost as if on cue, when hearing the news that the third estate had adopted a new title. Those of the clergy who wished to join them as an order pressed harder than ever for union. A vote was taken. A priest threw open one of the windows, and the cry went out to the waiting crowd. One! One! Instantly, this development destroyed the coalition between the privileged orders. It also drove home the fact that the priests of Rome were in full sympathy with the proceedings taking place. Cleverly though, as a protective buffer against any idea that Rome was the instigator of these unruly revolts, many prelates and priests remained loyal to the old regime. When the new constitution had been drawn up and it was, and it was required to take an oath to show public support of it, the 1912 Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 13, Page 11, under the subject Revolution, has this to say, quote, The National Archives preserve the complete dockets of 42 departments which were sent to the con Constituent Assembly by the civil authorities. This shows that in these departments, of 23,093 priests called upon to swear, 13,118 took the oath. There would be therefore out of 100 priests, 56 to 57 jurors, who were obedient against 43 to 44 non-jurors, who were disobedient. An actual fact, and that's, uh, by the way, that was the end of the quotation. In actual fact, a number of bishops were leaders in the movement, such as Talleyrand of Autumn, Brienne of Sens, who became finance minister, Girante of Orleans, and Lafond de Savine of Vivers, as well as assistant bishops such as Goebel, coadjutor bishop of Bale, 
Marshal de Brienne, coadjutor of Sens, and Duborg Merode, Bishop of Babylon. Wow. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> at the fest at the festival of the federation in commemoration a year after the fall of the bastille we find on july 14th 1790 bishop talleyrand and 300 priests officiating at the altar of the nation who besought the blessings of god on the revolution taken from the same catholic encyclopedia and subject revolution page 11 Events now quickened their pace. Alarmed by the strides and revolutionary behavior of the Third Estate, the king, pressed by the queen and his court, announced that he would hold a meeting on June 23, 1789. Presided over by himself and addressed the estates to declare that the actions of the commons were illegal. Here we go. Here comes the dialectic. And to prevent any more meetings, the building of the meeting halls were locked. Undeterred by this action, and at the suggestion of Dr. Joseph Ignace Guillotine, let me read that name again. Undeterred by this action, and at the suggestion of Dr. Joseph Ignace Ignacier Guillotine, the gentleman for which the decapitation machine was named, the members of the National Assembly hurried to a nearby indoor tennis court to continue their deliberations. It was here on June 20th that every delegate except one took their famous oath and signed their names, vowing never to separate until an acceptable constitution was, est was established on solid foundations quote-unquote to deny them again a meeting place the king's brother Comte d'artois booked the tennis court for a game now see some of my french ain't that bad <laughs> you know like i said i mean this chapter has really been a tough one for pronunciation on my behalf so again i really feel you know i really apologize for any Frenchmen that might be listening to this, that I'm probably butchering a lot of these names. Uh, <laughs> so please forgive me. Anyways, the king's brother booked the tennis court for a game. This time, the parish priest opened to them the doors of the Church of St. Louis, and here they welcomed the majority of the clergy into their new meeting place. Two nobles from Dauphine also joined them, followed by a group of nobles from Guienne, who were greeted with enthusiastic applause. On the 23rd of June, 1789, the king arriving with great pomp and fanfare, escorted by cavalry and a company of household guards, delivered his speech to the assembled estates. There were certain concessions the monarchy was prepared to make, but he made it clear that the ancient regime was not to be dismantled. As to emphasize this, the wording of the king's speech was more threatening than conciliatory, and pointed out that if any reforms were to come, they would be granted by himself and not won by demand. He said, quote, None of your plans or proceedings can become law without my express approval. I command you to disperse at once and to proceed tomorrow morning to the separate rooms set aside for your orders so that you may resume your deliberations." Unquote. With these words, he walked out of the hall, followed by the contended nobles and some clergy who had been assured of their continuing privileges. Comte de Honore, Gabriel Mirabeau, seized his opportunity. Gentlemen, he called, rising to his feet, 
his powerful voice echoing round the walls while trumpets sounded outside as the royal coach rattled away. We are being dictated to in an insulting manner. I demand that you assume your legislative powers and adhere to the faith of your oath. It allows us to disband only after we have made the Constitution. By June 27th, most of the clergy and 47 of the nobles, led by the Deuce d'Orleans, had joined the National Assembly. The victory of the Assembly seemed secure. Only force could dislodge it. <clears throat> and so the king calls in troops. Force was exactly what the king had in mind. By the first weeks of July, he had summoned in ten regiments of troops, mostly German and Swiss, with 6,000 occupying Versailles and 10,000 around Paris. It set the nation aflame. The assembly and the people believed that the king was planning to disperse or intimidate them. Multitudes gathered around the Palace Royale and swore to defend the National Assembly at whatever cost. The municipal authorities were unable to maintain order, for they could not rely upon the local French guards, some pledging to obey no orders that were hostile to the National Assembly. The 407 men who had elected the deputies of the Third Estate for Paris met and substituted themselves for the royal government of the capital. The old council abandoned to them the task of protecting life and property. It was this group of men who appointed Jean Sylvain Bailey, mayor of Paris and Lafayette, commander of the citizens, militia, which was shortly to become the National Guard. The ferment, the ferment at Paris was beyond conception. 10,000 people expressing their fury of liberty. Mirabeau, that awesome and elegant speaker, stirred up his listeners in a violent speech on the 8th of July, declaring, quote, A large number of troops already surround us. More are arriving each day. Artillery are being brought up. These preparations for war are obvious to anyone and fill every heart with indignation. Anger and fear were now at a boiling point. Only a word was needed to arouse and ignite the populace into a violent response. <clears throat> that word just happened to be supplied by a Jesuit educated gentleman named Camille Desmoulins who on the afternoon of July 12th being near the Palace Royal, Royale leaped upon a table and cried out the German troops in the Champ de Mars will enter Paris tonight to butcher the inhabitants I said only a word was needed to arouse and no sooner when the crowd was expecting this word to happen here comes a Jesuit educated gentleman stands out in the open air and cries out the German troops and the Champ de Mars will enter Paris tonight to butcher the inhabitants <laughs> Is the plot starting to unravel itself as to who's behind these things? Bear in mind, they've been suppressed. <laughs> oh man. You're gonna you're gonna hear some of these quotes and they're gonna seem very familiar to you in your textbooks that you've read in school. So <clears throat> well, the German troops in the Champ de Mars will enter Paris tonight to butcher the inhabitants. 
Then, brandishing both a pistol and a sword, he called to the mob, To arms! He climbed down from the table into the swirling crowd, who then loudly repeated his call, To arms! That reverberated on every side. He fastened a green ribbon to his hat and urged everyone else to wear some sort of green cockade in token of their support for the common cause. They did so until it became dangerous to be seen out of doors without a hat garnished with green. A crowd of 8,000 people marched off to search and ransack the town for weapons. In two days, 50,000 pikes had been forged, 12 pieces of artillery, and 32,000 muskets had been found and captured, but very little gun, but very little gunpowder. By the 14th of July, the crowd had surged to 60,000 people. It was said that the Bastille came, contained a great store of arms and ammunition, especially powder. The cry went out, To the Bastille! And the crowd had become an irresistible force. The rest is history. The Bastille was stormed on July 14th and fell as predicted by Cagliostro. The Bastille's governor was butchered, his head whittled off by a pocket knife, and as a gruesome trophy stuck on the end of a pike, and the crowd marched with it through Paris on a triumphal parade. This is a result of revolution. As for the Bastille being torn down, as was also predicted, the next morning, a contractor and patriot by the name of, P of Palloy specializing in the demolition of buildings with a thousand workmen, began stone by stone to bring the prison down. The fortress, as old and dark as the feudal system it symbolized, had hung like doom over the poor inhabitants of the east end of Paris. Its stones, now flung upon the ground, were used into a new bridge built over the... over, over the... Cyan, 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 and into the stairways of private houses, so that they could be trodden underfoot by patriots. A key of the Bastille was presented by Lafayette to George Washington, the foster parent of the French Revolution. With its destruction, a new age was hoped to come into being. Patriots dated their letters from July 14th as the first day of the first year of liberty. The king, when told of the news, had to face the fact that it was not just a revolt, but revolution. <clears throat> and that his only safety lay in immediate cooperation with the National Assembly. Making an in informal entry, he announced to the deputies that he had given orders for the withdrawal of the troops. The deputies cheered, but when popularity can only be won by concessions and violence, or by appeals to sentiment, the end is near. And as predicted by the magician Saint Germain, the king's head was also to topple. So here you had you had these two magicians, Cagliostro and Saint Germain, predicting all of these events that were now taking place just years prior now was it just predicted by the uh, magical utterances from beyond or were these things already pre-planned and so that when it came out to perform their acts they can come out and predict predict these things and Lo and behold, it happens. You can see a lot of that going on today. I'll give you a very, very strong example. Okay. You have numerous, probably very sincere Christians who will write books regarding Israel. And how all of these disasters that happen on America are judgments of God. Because we have done Israel wrong. You see? So, 
now you have to ask the question with with all of the weather modifications that has been set up and designed and these types of things is it really an act of God that if something bad happens to Israel on our behalf that America gets punished for it <laughs> or was it pre-planned that way Anyways, back to the book. I'll leave that question to yourselves. <clears throat> or the answer to that question you can keep to yourselves. Anyways, French New Age becomes licensed to murder. The French New Age of Liberty became a license to murder, whether by bands of insurgents armed with sabers, pikes, and axes that stabbed, hacked, and beat to death their victims, or by the operations of what the deputy J.A.B. Amar called the Red Mass, performed on the great altar of the Holy Guillotine. The shrieks of death were blended with the yell of the assassin and the laughter of buffoons. Under the rallying call of unity, liberty, equality, fraternity, or death, it became dangerous to be considered less revolutionary than your neighbor. <sighs> Let me repeat that again. Under the rallying call of unity, liberty, equality, fraternity, or death, it became dangerous to be considered less revolutionary than your neighbor. Think of what's going on in America today. With all of these riots, Black Lives Matter. On the other side, you have, you know, you have the issues of the Confederate flag and these types of things. And you have people like Alex Jones stirring up the crowd, patriotism that, American freedom this, American freedom that. And you got all of these truth movement individuals shouting for the same thing. But yet, if you don't let your voice be heard, or if you speak out against both sides of these things, you are considered less revolutionary than your neighbor. On the flip side, you have the liberal mindset of equality, equality for all, the LGBT agenda, transgenderism, and all of these things going on. All you have to do is to look back at this French Revolution and look back at who was pulling the strings of this revolution behind closed doors and you are going to be able to see and a lot of things are going to be opened up to you because I mean I mean and don't get me wrong I mean the American Revolution was basically you know not as may have not had maybe not as bloody as this one but the context of it was basically the same. Okay? And... But when you really dive deep into this French Revolution, and the context of it, and how the people were rallied upon, especially by the individual um, Camille Desmoulins, uh, Jesuit educated man might want to look him up I probably will after I get done with this reading because uh, that name because it seems interesting to me now but <laughs> when you look at the things of the French Revolution especially in this next section next couple sections okay all you have to do is just realize it when Ecclesiastes says that there is no new thing under the sun 
that what you see in the events of this revolution is the same thing that is going on today. All right. We have echoes of liberty, echoes of freedom, equality, fraternity, you know, and, and this is that rallying call of unity. We have that same rallying call for unity going on today. And a lot of that is also centered on this election year as well. So, very interesting times we are living in, folks. And to look back at history is... I wouldn't have to... I wouldn't necessarily say it's a must. But it would prove to be a good idea to do so. And again, that's why I'm presenting this book. And once I get done with this next few chapters I will be including this book sources so be patient okay that's why I just keep an eye on the description boxes of the videos <clears throat> anyways back to the book thousands upon thousands became victims to where an, where an accurate account became impossible the time came which was foretold by Madame Roland when the people would ask for bread and be given corpses. For a citizen to become suspect, said George Couthon, president of the convention, it is sufficient that rumor accuses him. Marat had declared, in order to ensure the public tranquility, 200,000 heads must be cut off. Liberty must prevail at any Price, cried St. Just, who, like Robespierre, regarded all dissidents as criminals. You must punish not merely traitors, but the indifferent as well. Liberty cannot be secured unless criminals lose their heads. Well, who are the criminals? Who are the criminals today? Could it be those less revolutionaries maybe you can use the term fundamentalists you see that one being pushed around a lot in heaven's name cried one sick of blood when will all this bloodshed cease whole families were led to the guillotine for no other crime than their relationship sisters for shedding tears over the death of their brothers wives for the heinous crime of weeping at the execution of their husbands innocent peasant girls for dancing with the german soldiers and a woman giving suck and whose milk spouted in the face of her executioner at the fatal stroke testify of the worst ex excesses and a kind of fever committed in the name of liberty Madame Roland, arrested and led to the guillotine, uttered her famous apostrophe. O oh, Liberty, what crimes are committed in your name? <laughs> Jeez. O oh, Liberty, what crimes are committed in your name? Now do you see why this whole aspect of Liberty is being used? by the beast out of the earth to cause all both rich and poor free and bond to receive a mark in their foreheads or in their right hands and this same beast out of the earth, out of the earth makes an image to the first beast and this first beast has all the politics they have a folks they got doctrines for every aspect of life you can dream of you want the aspect of liberty they have it okay um you want freedom you want their version of freedom? They have a doctrine for that too. 
And as a matter of fact, I mean, if you can pain to read it, read the books by Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas is basically the doctor of the Roman Catholic Church considered. And he spoke on both fronts. He spoke on behalf of the conservative Catholic that, you know, t today, in retrospect of, like, the Inquisitions and these types of things, as well as things that are echoed by your founding fathers, Jefferson and um, Thomas Paine and Benjamin Franklin and all of these guys. This whole notion of liberty... is all focused on committed crimes in its name. Oh, Liberty, what crimes are committed in your name? Now all you got to do is think of the wars and endless wars that we have been involved in. How many wars, how many lives have been lost? How many countries destroyed? Because of a faceless enemy. For the protection of liberty. Oh liberty what crimes are committed in your name. You know and, and the same ones that perpetrated this French revolution. Just years before. Were the ones behind the American revolution. And so what you are seeing here are, you know, the heads behind the scenes were the same heads that fomented the American Revolution, as we will soon see a little bit later on in this book. O oh, Liberty, what crimes are committed in your name? As the revolution escalated and was wrenched from the hands of the original revolutionaries into the hands of the Jacobins with Robespierre, their leader, the king was guillotined, the queen was guillotined, and most of Robespierre's antagonists were guillotined. Atheists who argued that there was no supreme being were guillotined. So atheists, you, you think you're... You think you're safe because, you know, you're on the outside looking in in the aspect of this religious war? No, you're not safe either. As a matter of fact, you best be picking a side quick. Danton was guillotined because he thought there was too much guillotine. Day by day, week by week, this holy machine chopped off heads and more heads and more. The reign of Robespierre lived. It seemed on blood and needed more and more, as an opium addict needs more and more opium. But the day came when Robespierre's head, too, was claimed by the guillotine. <clears throat> There is no need to go much further into the great revolution of France. History has all too well supplied us with an untold amount of books that make us shudder at the almost inhuman, senseless, and grisly scenes during that time. No one was safe. Either you performed with gusto your acts of but butchery which certified your sentiments, or become suspects. To become suspect meant death, but not always instant. In comparison to many unfortunates who were mutilated alive, the guillotine that detached a head and allowed blood to profusely flow was dreadful and terrifying, but in reality was merciful, so it was claimed. But however you want to consider it, wholesale murder, death, and blood became a routine daily sight in France. This was the quote-unquote liberty and quote-unquote freedom offered and sponsored by the Illuminati and its Jesuits who acted through their agents of the Jacobin Club. But it did not stop here. 
with the death of Robespierre, the revolution had about run its course in France. It now turned its fury instead upon Europe. Under the leadership of Napoleon Bonaparte, also a member of the Jacobin Club, deaths were not counted in the thousands, but millions. The architects of all this carnage must have thought. Truly, the design was grand. The Jacobins, not to be confused with the Jacobites, was a political club, like so many other political clubs that sprung up in France during the Re Revolution, with two exceptions. First, from its founding, its political views were recognized as being extremely radical. And second, from which the first was a natural product, it was the fountain through which the Jesuit and Illuminati waters directly flowed. After the assembling of the States General, the deputies from Brittany formed the club Breton. This soon widened its membership to include non-Bretons like Mirabeau, C.A., and Robespierre. In October 1789, it moved its headquarters to Paris where it met at the Dominican convent, <laughs> inherent the nickname of the monks of the Rue saint Honore to become famous as the Jacobin Club. And the formulation of radical opinion, its influence spread all, spread all over France, where the number of similar clubs in the provinces grew month by month until there were over 3,000 of them. At the end of March of, of 1790, Robespierre was elected president of the Jacobin Club who supported terror and ultimately became completely identified with it during the dictatorship reign, or during his dictatorship reign. It should not come as a surprise that Robespierre received his degree after nine years at the famous Jesuit college, Louis Le Grand, where also one of the masters included Jean Liron de Ellenbert, a contributor to the encyclopedia. Participants in the Great Work At every turn, we see the guiding hand of Rome, influential archbishops, bishops, and Roman clergy leading and stirring up their people into the spirit of the revolution. Rome always officially excuses the conduct of these wayward prelates as being mavericks or renegades, but unofficially, they perform marvelously in the Great Work. No better example could be given than the Archbishop of Paris, Jean-Baptiste Gobel, who was a sworn leader of the revolution. Quoted from the 1911 edition of the Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 11, page 484, under the topic Paris, quote, At the beginning of 1793, he, Gobel, was at the head of about 600 sworn priests about 500 of whom were employed in parishes. On November 7, 1793, he solemnly declared before the convention that his subordinates and he renounced the duties of ministers of Catholic worship, whereupon the convention congratulated him on having sacrificed the grotesque baubles of superstition." Unquote. These high-ranking bishops, archbishops, clergymen, folks, they're not just people in black garb with little, with little white collars. They're very smart. They're very educated. They know how to manipulate. And they know how to perceive to be for the other side. And they can do it very, very well. <clears throat> Bishop Perigord Tellyrand and Abbey Joseph C.A. are another two examples of direct Roman, Roman Catholic influence. Both men working together openly, guiding the revolution. They also work together to bring about the coup 
that set up Napoleon Bonaparte as the first consul of the French Republic. They assisted the first consul in the drafting of the Concordat with Rome. There was also Champion de Saisse, Archbishop of Bordeaux, Champion of the Jesuits, Jean T. Pampignan, Archbishop of Vienne, La Luzerne, Bishop of Langres, and again Talleyrand, Bishop of Autun, who were all presidents of the National Assembly. When you have this kind of prestigious religious leadership, whom the people so highly venerated and even hallowed, then nothing less could be expected of the great masses except they be their obedient followers. The evidence of a vigorously working conspiracy becomes overwhelmingly abundant when you examine the names and the overlapping lives of the leaders involved in the French Revolution. We have previously mentioned Frederick II, the Great, the Great Prussian War King, and his key role as the supreme head of Freemasonry's Scottish Rite. We know he greatly favored the Jesuits and sheltered them when their order was dissolved, supposedly. He also made the Jesuit educated encyclopedist Denis Diderot and encyclopedist Jesuit educator Jean d'Alembert members of his Royal Academy of Prussia and offered d'Alembert the presidency of the Academy, which he refused. D'Alembert in 1755 and again in 1763 visited Frederick in Germany and received his pension regularly from Berlin. Frederick the Great's brother-in-law and military pupil, Duke Ferdinand of Brunswick, as has already been quoted from the Catholic Encyclopedia, became Illuminati and was the foremost leader of European Freemasonry and the princely representative of the Illuminism of his age. Now, in the service of the Duke Brunswick, was a Frenchman, Lieutenant Colonel Moivion, who had been most active during the formal existence of the Illuminati Order, and had contributed much to its reception in the Protestant states of Germany. He remained long concealed, it was through the intermedium of this man, Moivion, that Adam Weishaupt communicated the honor of becoming an Illuminati to another Frenchman, Court Gabriel Mirabeau. Mirabeau came into the order from the beginning, apparently as one of its founders, and went under the illuminated name of Ars Arsilas and later under that of Leonidas. I can't remember. What was the... Wasn't one of the main characters in the movie 300, Leonidas? The memoir found at his house outlined the program of the Illuminati evolved by him in collaboration with an inner ring of Freemasons belonging to the Lodge Theodore. Mirabeau stood out as one of the most noted figures during the early stages of the French Revolution. Without exception, every chief actor in the French Revolution was either Jesuit educated, a Catholic prelate, or a member of the Illuminati Order where within the Jacobin Club they would come together to conspire and carry out the great work which in the open system of the Jacobins was the reflection of the complete hidden system of the Illuminati, and in back of the Illuminati were the hidden Jesuit masters as faithfully as the terrorists carried out the plan of the Illuminati. They themselves were not initiated into the innermost secrets of the conspiracy. In other words, behind the National Assembly, behind the Convention, behind the clubs, behind the Revolutionary Tribunal, there existed that most secret convention, which directed everything, an occult and terrible power of which the other convention became, become, or became the slave. This power was above Robespierre, 
and the Committee of Government above Danton, Marat, de Molines, and Louis Saint Just, above the Duce d'Orleans, and even above the Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. It also had something much greater in mind than just the triumph of a revolution confined to France. World Revolution, Rome's Ticket to World Domination From the very beginning, the French revolutionaries repeatedly declared in their manifestos and demonstrated by their conduct that the revolution must inevitably lead to the ruin of all thrones. Therefore, we must hasten among our neighbors the same revolution that is going on in France. The diplomatic committee, who were commissioned to deliberate on the conduct which France had was to hold with other nations, decreed on December 15, 1793, quote, The Committee of Finance and War asked in the beginning, What is the object of the war which we have taken in hand? Without all doubt, the object is the annihilation of all privileges, war with the palaces, peace with the cottages cottages these are the principles on which your declaration of war is founded all tyranny all privilege must be treated as an enemy in the countries where we set our foot we must therefore declare ourselves for a revolutionary power in all the countries into which we enter unquote so at the point of the bayonet, France administered, administered her liberty to her surrounding nations. Then, by way of compensating to France for the trouble she had taken, they were plundered of all they had. No French general excelled in the great work more than Napoleon Bonaparte. The sober reality is that the perpetrators of the French Revolution used France as a prototype and launching pad aimed to bring the revolution worldwide. A simple illustration of this world revolution, in fact being extended down to our own times and enhanced with a touch of French that most can understand and are familiar with, is the controversial word communism. Communism comes from the French word commune, which means the inhabitants of any place who are bound together by common interests and administration, especially in a town with a munis municipality. During the times of the French Revolution, the word les communes came to be used of the common people or their representatives, the commons. Clearly, by their own declarations, world revolution is the very aim of the Illuminati. And to perfection, it also serves Rome in her aims to govern the world and achieve what her very name implies, universal domination. In the 200 years since the French Revolution, there has been two world wars, the so-called Communist Revolu Revolution, and all the other wars in between that has provided time and much experience to whip and mold the world into Rome's grand design goal. The Illuminati motto is, out of chaos comes order. By that it is meant, by war, revolution, and devastation, the world will be reduced to such a state of chaos that whatever is left will have to submit to their utopian new world order. But who is that nation that Rome has chosen to play its main superstar role in her final great work thrust? That will administer all this devastation and destruction upon the world? Here we go. Now we're going to get into the meat and potatoes because here is the answer and we are going to be expounding upon that answer in the next several chapters. Grieving sadly. With deep felt emotion, it has been re revealed, designed, and 
prophesied that our beloved nation, the United States of America, will commit these terrible end time acts. Thus concludes chapter 12 of the Grand Design Exposed, the perpetrators and evolution of the Great French Revolution. And if you take anything away from this chapter at all, take this one away, is that the perpetrators of the French Revolution was used as a prototype into a world revolution which really when you look around I'm talking about you know the I mean, you know, I mean I'm talking about worldwide you see you, you can you can basically smell the smoke of revolution in the air uh, and and you know the kind of bloodshed and chaos that ensued during the French Revolution. And if we can learn anything from the French Revolution, folks, what we have going on today that is basically echoing what went on in France, it's not going to be a pretty picture. And... See, the thing is, the beast out of the sea, they have to remain hidden. They have to remain as the peacemakers now. Because anything else would easily expose themselves. Because they know what kind of past they have. And so that's why they need the beast out of the earth. To do its dirty work for them. And if you can identify... The similarities between the beast out of the earth, which makes an image to the beast out of the sea, and you can see the similarities, albeit in technological advances in today's day and age, then you're gonna have the piece you're gonna have the piece of piece of the puzzle put together. But uh We've went through 12 chapters of this um, remarkable history. And chapter 13 starts with the title, <clears throat> England's Religious War Expanded to New World. So now we're really going to be, as I stated, we're going to be getting into the meat and potatoes of... Uh, Uncharted waters of history that uh, has been deliberately left out. Left out of the schools, left out of the colleges, left out of the universities. And frankly, many people, just many common people, don't have a clue. You know, because they're brought up, you know, with this notion of. You know, being set free from the terrible um, bondage of King George and our war for independence and these types of things. And all in the guise of tea and taxes. But if you understand who was really pulling the strings, then you are going to be ahead of the game. And you don't have to jump through many rabbit holes. You really don't. But just remember that this society of Jesus, they are just as much as powerful as they were 500 years ago. Their tactics for war may have changed. But don't think for a second that what you see in the public as a Jesuit priest all dressed up in fancy priestly garb that they're not a threat because folks they got their diocese divided into ten within this nation so 
that's another topic for another day. But I want to thank you for enduring this uh, grand finale of this chapter. And um, stay tuned for chapter 13. And uh, it's going to get very interesting. So also be on the lookout for the previous grand design videos, readings that I did for the book sources that are listed within the last couple chapters. I will be putting those in uh, probably throughout the week. And so be on the lookout for those. All you have to do is go through the last two chapters and uh, they'll eventually be there. So you don't have to click on every video. Just click on one. They'll be, I mean, because they're going to be copy and pasted, you know, with each chapter. So thank you for listening. Truth be told, truth be known, stay safe, God bless, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.